Hey everybody, and welcome to our early comics review video. I'm Andy. I'm Matt. We're here with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this is our bigger show where we go over a bunch of the biggest and best books we think you want to know about when you head to your local comic book store or receive them uh, from ordering them online. So you know a little bit more about them. You're better prepared. Uh, and sometimes it's just hard to know what are these things about. Yeah. Uh, we've got a few in the beginning that need some explanation. And that's what we're here for so just a reminder, uh, hit like and subscribe if you like talking about comics. And head over to infinityflux.net where you can order these books while supplies last while we're talking about them. Mm -hmm. So really easy one there. Yeah, and everything we're going to talk about is already on our website. Megan yep. double confirmed that everything is good to go. So you can order these like the minute we're talking about them. You can order them. rip right them out now. of our hands. That's right. we're talking about. That's right. So let's get going. Yeah, we are going to start with uh, what I think is the biggest book this week. And this is Ghost Machine number one. So what this is, um, is a collection of... Uh, previews essentially of some of these stories, some of the books that are coming from Ghost Machine, which, if you don't know, is a new kind of imprint with Image Comics. I think of Skybound, Robert Curtin's yeah. Skybound, uh, has a, it's its own separate sort of little imprint, but it's under the Image banner. And now Ghost Machine is the exact same thing, uh, like that, but this is with Jeff Johns, Gary Frank, Jason Fabok, Francis Manipal. Peter Tomasi, yep. uh, there's and, and a bunch more. So there are a whole bunch of these big time creators got together and and started up this uh, this image imprint called Ghost Machine, and it's already got a whole bunch of books slated to come out, and this gives us a a little tease on some of those books. What do you say tease? It's a, it's a pretty substantial, well, yeah, it's, bit, and it's not like these are pages they've ripped out of the stories. These right. are kind of little prequel stories to what's coming yeah up. each one is like four or five pages uh and so and the good thing about this book is so it's 4.99 but this is a thick book yeah. and you get a lot of different stories like i said four or five pages for like five or six different stories at least so there's a lot of good stuff in here so it starts off with the unnamed so <laughs> so ghost machine has separate uh i kind of want to say universes like the, you have the unnamed which is your your books like geiger junkyard joe uh red coat uh there's another one um the 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 northerner i the think northerner, yeah um and all of those take place in the same universe there's like a there's a timeline that tells you uh all of these books that are part of this unnamed universe here's sort of the timeline of everything but there are other stories in here that are not part of that unnamed timeline but they're still part of the ghost machine imprint yeah, i think you know image does stuff like this like with uh you've got of course image and skybound and you have like radiant black and that has books that take place yeah. within the radio like radio the Black universe. universe yeah. but that doesn't take place in the same universe as walking dead right so this also has kind of its own built-in continuities and stuff yeah. that are that are cool that you know it's easier to think of this like this is a new company and they've got these different lines yeah. that they're doing yeah so the first couple stories in this book uh, there's a there's a short geiger story and red coat and i will say for those it's nothing we haven't really seen before it gave us a little um just a little tea i actually thought the geiger story we had seen those few pages before i don't think so uh because this is kind of leading into the ongoing guy yeah, story. Yeah. But we have seen like the characters that appear. In yeah, definitely. Before. So the Geiger and the Redcoat stories don't really tell us anything new. If you've read Geiger or if you read that Geiger, was it like an 80 page special? Yeah. There was a short Redcoat story in there about a, uh, a, a, a British soldier during the revolutionary war who uh, became immortal uh, in a fight with George Washington, who is also some kind of supernatural it's something a or other. Superhero world, if like all of, like the the like historical figures were kind of like pseudo superheroes. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you interesting. see, you see like young Einstein. Yeah, and he's a uh, is he talks about like he's a super genius, but also like there's a hint of magic. Yeah, and Davy Crockett who hunted uh, Sasquatch. Right, right, so right. So there's always like kind of an X factor to all of yeah, the stories. Yeah, Annie Oakley really cool. was, was, was part yeah. of that as well. So really interesting there. Um, but not a whole lot of brand new stuff, I'll say, for those two properties. But 
Then it gets into what my uh, most anticipated book out of all of this is, and that's Rook. And that's by Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok. Now, this is really, really cool. And I was interested in it when we just first heard about it, yeah. just based on the visuals, because Jason Fabok's art is fantastic. But now that we've read this, we understand a little bit more about what this story is, and I'm double on board for it. So it takes place in the 24th century, and it takes place on a planet called Exodus, which is a terraformed world that uh, where every aspect of nature, from the weather to the animals, it's all controlled by man, basically. Um, but at some point along the way, the, the world engine failed. And so everybody who could leave, they left. And now the people who are left are are trying to either save the planet or get off the planet. Yeah, they kind of thought the corporation that set all this up would be like, they're going to come back and save us, yeah. and they never. They never up. did, and it and it feels it feels um, kind of sort of post apocalyptic. Although there's jungles and stuff, so yeah. not quite the same. Feels a little bit Mad Max. Yeah, uh, because we're going to get some crazy. It uh, looks like there's there's some weapons and some vehicles and stuff. So it kind of has that sort of flavor to it, but not exactly. Um, and and it's all centered around these people called wardens who wear these special helmets. And we'll see some more close-ups here in a second. But these helmets give them the ability to control certain animals. Yeah. So the main character of the book, his name is Rook. He it was, He's a farmer. He was a farmer on Exodus. And now he's a warden. And he can control different types of birds from rooks to crows to something uh, i can't remember what the other one was uh there's a character called swine who wears this big like he's great he's great he wears this big like metallic metallic like pig helmet looking yeah. thing he can control pigs and boars uh there's this character right here named dire wolf who can control wolves and we get a little preview page of the other masks. of other ones yeah so and there's like a serpent one yeah there's a bunch of yeah. really cool looking and it gave me, it made me think, I'm an 80s kid, so it kind of made me think of Mask. Yeah. How they all wore special helmets that gave them certain abilities, although the abilities in this is the ability to control certain animals. And I'm a 90s kid, so I thought of Bionicles. Oh, there you where go. Where they all have like the different masks, yeah. and they, they can like switch masks, and it gives them powers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was very, very cool. Uh, so it's it's a little bit of, it's 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 very sci-fi. Uh, there's gonna be some some action, some gunplay, some like I said, vehicles and 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 that kind of stuff. And not all the wardens, they're not like all on one big team. Like yeah. some of them are against some other ones. Like so Rook and Swine are are kind of friends, yeah. but then Dire Wolf, she's like kind of a they used to be friends, they used to like train together, but now she's off and yeah. you don't know if there's gonna be some uh, you know, fighting between them. Yeah, uh, it's it's very cool. Like I don't know how good of a job we are explaining it, but it's very very cool. Sci-fi, a little bit of Mad Max, a little bit of post-apocalyptic on another planet, controlling animals. Like it's very neat. I really liked Rook. And then there's another sort of section called Family Odyssey. Well, you did mention though is between all of these, there's a Who's Who page. Oh right, that's really nice. So you read the story, and if you have any questions or whatever, like. The old traditional like DC uh, who's who or yeah. Marvel, uh, you get the character, you get like you know their their hair color, their yeah. eye color, first appearance, first and appearance, whatever. what their what their powers, powers are. are, and that's great. Like Geiger, we know Redco, we kind of know, but there's even some characters in the Geiger part that's mentioned, yeah. that we don't see that right. are new, right? And the one it kind of explains like the relationship between Rook and Swine, mm -hmm. in that there's. And each of the sections have kind of that thing, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so there's another section called Family Odysseys. And there's two different books under this umbrella, I guess. And the first one I really like, too, called The Rocket Fellers, written by Peter Tomasi. And the art is by Francis Manipal, so it looked great. Yeah. And this feels like the Jetsons, Jetsons. <laughs> mixed with Fantastic Four, but not, not with powers, but the science and adventure aspect, because they're a family. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's about a... It's about a dad and his wife, and their two kids, and the the dad's dad, uh, and their dog, and the dad's mom, but in a robot body. Like, um, and they're they're from the 25th century, but they discovered that their future was in danger. So they actually traveled back to 2024 in the hopes of saving their future and maybe even saving the world. But there is an organization known as Vertex following them around. So they're trying to blend into what is present day to us, but they're from centuries away. 
and they're all frustrated by the like the technology yeah. and like they have slow internet speeds and yeah. they, they can't agree on where to get food and stuff like that. Um, and it's this wasn't uh, soup this this story anyway. It wasn't super action heavy. It's more about them being a family. They don't wear crazy costumes or yeah. anything like that. But the the son does have like rocket shoes. So there's a picture of him sort of flying around in his yeah. rocket shoes. Um, but it just feels very. Um, Sci-fi, but adventure, family adventure kind of thing, kind of like um, a little Swiss Family Robinson. Yeah, and maybe a little bit of Johnny Quest. Yeah, you know, that just just all these different. Like it felt like it could be a modern day Hanna Barbera cartoon. Yeah, really, is, is what yeah, it could be. When you say the Jetsons, it's like yeah, if the Jetsons had to go back in time and right. live in modern day, right. It kind of is that. Yeah, so that one was really really fun, and it also had that page explaining who all the different family members were. Um, then there's another story, another uh, yeah, another story called Hornsby and Halo, written by Peter Tomasi and the art is by Peter uh, Snez- Snezberg. And the story between this is it's centered on a uh, a young boy and a girl. They're both 12 years old, but uh, if they are in order to keep there's we just think they're like oh there are these two kids and they're going to go play baseball. But what it turns out is that um, the the I should have written down their names. The boy is actually. Uh, an angel and the girl is a, a demon yeah. basically and to keep the peace between heaven and hell the uh, there was a deal brokered between the angels and demons to swap the the demon child of an angel family yeah. and the angel child of a demon family they swapped them but they're on earth for some reason i'm not quite yeah. sure on that we didn't get all that much information out of that story uh and the children don't really know who they are yet the girl kind of has, she, she does like some fire stuff. She crosses her fingers and a little bit of flame comes out. Um, and it says in the uh, data page, it says that they will um, sort of exhibit some abilities when they hit puberty. And it's kind of, it's a nature versus nurture. It's yeah. like, if they're raised by the other family, does that change them at all? Right. Or are they kind of destined to be what they were born yeah. as? And yeah. Stuff. So, and then there's, some, you know, a shadowy figure watching them. So, and I feel like these two stories that are under this are a little bit more all ages. Yeah. yeah. I, there's a little bit of language, nothing heavy in the uh, Rocket Fellers, but mm-hmm. in general, they're kind of dealing with like younger characters, kind of a, a young adult, teen, right. tween er- yeah. area. And then the last story that we get in this uh, is a story called Hyde Street, H-Y-D-E, Hyde Street, written by Jeff Johns and the artist by Ivan Rice. And I'm not 100% sure what this is yet. We don't get a whole lot of so information. this is really interesting because I kind of broke this down because at first I thought the entire thing was Hyde Street. And right. I don't know if that's another kind of imprint, like how it was the Family Odyssey uh-huh. and the Unnamed. So Hyde Street, that was actually broken up. It felt like a continuous story, but it was actually three separate things in it. So hmm. uh, we have... Uh, one that is basically like setting it up where we have a a movie producer. Right. And he's uh he's kind of your like snide. He doesn't like the small town they're filming in. Yeah. It's it's terrible. They don't they can't even make a decent cup of coffee type thing. And a small uh Boy Scout comes to him and is like, Oh, I can help you find what you're looking for because he's kind of lost in this town. And it looks like this Boy Scout maybe is taking him to Hyde Street, which is kind of a uh a place where like horror, like a horror street yeah. type thing. But what I like an re- Elm Street, like Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. yeah but what I didn't realize is uh, this is actually there is one called uh, Devour. So we see this. This is also it, it could be that they're all pretty much drawn by Ivan Rice. Mm-hmm. There's one called Devour that takes place in the '80s, right. where a lady goes in. And it's kind of about like a weird weight loss supplement. Yeah. That uh, you know is is kind of iffy and creepy. Uh, that's actually a separate story that's going to be a separate book. Oh, it's going to be a separate book. Okay, because yeah. I because I noticed that I thought it was just like jumping back in time and uh, because it's in the middle of the story. So this with is what that. I thought was weird. So looking at the book, you can see the credits page. So Hyde Street actually is Hyde Street Amusements, Hyde Street and Devour. Okay, and they're three different. Two written by Jeff Johns and Devour is written by uh, Maytel Shoot. And uh, so I think those are going to be separate okay. books. And when you go to the end of it, it gives you kind of a primer of books. And so you have like Devour, First Ghost, Hornsby and Hill, High Street, Rocket Village, and The Soulless. 
So oh, okay. Devour and Heights are two separate books. Ah, so I didn't, I didn't pick up on yeah, that. Yeah, but it's kind of seamless. But I think it's really interesting yeah. that uh, you know we got all these different tones and everything. Yeah, and High Street becomes very horror at the yeah. end. I, no, no, I, I just made a couple notes on that one. I said I'm not quite sure about this yet because I didn't really understand how it all fit together. But it gave me a uh, creep show vibes. Yeah. Because it did seem just kind of like a random story of something horrific happening to a yeah. random person. Um, so I, I very much liked and it. The like the art by Ivan Rice Oh, fantastic. yeah. It looked great. So, I mean, I'm very much on board to learn more about it. But that's the one I probably understand the least yeah. out of this book. Um, but especially Rook and the Rocket Fellers were my two favorites. Um, but everything in here was really cool. So... I know it sounds like a lot, but um, this isn't this isn't just like one story. You get like a few pages of a whole bunch of different stories to get you ready for when these full books actually yeah. do come out later in, in the which, year. In uh, which the ongoing Geiger series and Redcoat come out March. Pretty soon, yeah. They're the first soon. ones. Yeah. They're the first ones. Um, and then Rook, I think, is maybe in the springtime yeah. or closer to summer. I'm very excited for that one. And uh, yeah, so. Just a, just a primer, just to show you uh, a lot of the good books coming out under this new Ghost Machine imprint. And I'm on board. Like, yeah, I, I, so I'm... all that to say, basically, check this out. It's got first appearances. Uh -huh. It even tells you kind of in their bios, like, this issue is their first appearance. It's basically everybody's first appearance except for the, the characters in the Geiger, in the, in the unnamed universe. Right. Um, and if you're looking for something new, maybe you're kind of like, well, you know, I read Batman, I read X-Men or whatever. Try this out because, yeah. you know, uh, I was a big fan of like the Invincible universe. Uh -huh. It had like Invincible, Brits, Capes, all of that. Uh, but that's not really around as much anymore. This is a great new world to, that you're getting in on the ground floor right. of. So pick this up and check it out. It's, you know, for what you get, it's a great price yeah. for it. And There's a lot in here for, it's for $5. Lot, and it, yeah. It's great that it gives you so many different stories that uh -huh. you could be like, okay, I, when these come out, I want to read this one, this yep. one, this one. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I love these sampler kind of pack mm -hmm. type things. Uh, so pick this one up because I think this is going to be something really big. Some huge names behind it. Oh, yeah. Some uh, of the biggest so. names in comics. Some of my favorite creators are all behind this. And they said in the back that there's more coming. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's no telling how much, you know, how much this will, how big this will get, yeah. I should say. So we talked about it for a while, but that's to tell you, like, yeah. hey, try this out if you didn't know what it was because this is going to be awesome. Yeah, there's, yeah. This, this deserved a, a little bit larger of a segment yeah. because there is so much in this. So to go with that, we have a bunch of variant covers. This is our A cover right here featuring it's a little um, bit of everything. Yeah, Geiger, Direwolf in the middle, and then Red Coat over there on the side. And then, and I don't even know what orders these are in. So this is just your blank uh, sketch cover. You can draw what maybe will be in Ghost Machine one day. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right. So we've also got this is the one I pre-ordered. This is a uh, this is Rook. That's a good look at Rook, and you can see the helmet right there that he wears. Although I, I almost wish I got this one because it's so cool. This is Direwolf from Rook. Uh, you can see her helmet. She's got a couple of wolves there. Very cool. We have this one I like a lot. This is the Rocket Fellers. So that gives you a nice idea as to the tone of this book. Very fun adventure, yeah. sci-fi. I'm enjoy I'm looking forward to that one. Here is one with Red Coat from Brian Hitch. So here is the A cover, but foil. Because every, everything looks better in foil, right? So that's the same thing, but just foil. We have one from Gary Frank with Geiger and his two-headed wolf. Uh, what's his, uh, Barney? Is that his name? Oh, I don't uh, remember. His dog's yeah. name. Here's one with uh, Hornsby and Halo. You can kind of see the gist there. And then here is one with uh, Hyde Street. And yeah, there's a, so there's the, there's the Boy Scout kid. There's the, the, the lady with about the Weight Watchers supplement. And then there's this guy with creepy x-ray specs, which is going to figure somehow. He does appear somehow. in there at one point. Yeah. Uh, th it also has a bunch of like old timey ads, like old comic yeah. book ads for x-ray specs. I and mean, instead of sea monkeys, they're piranha monkeys or something right, like that. Right, yeah. and it's it's kind of a weird twist on all of that that's really cool. And then here's another Hyde Street one that's a lot more gruesome that kind of mirrors this a little bit, you can see. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's two Hyde Street covers. So yeah, a lot of covers, a lot of material, lots to sort of pour over, but uh, it's all really good and I'm excited for all of it. Well, continuing on, I have a big one. This is Star Wars Thrawn Alliances. So, uh, this is by Timothy Zahn, 
Jody Hauser did the adaptation with Pat, Pat Olive and Andrea DeVito, and this is an adaptation of the novel Star Wars Thrawn Alliances uh, by Timothy Zahn. But this is great. This is, uh, you know, some of us have a harder time getting through the big, thick novels. Me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I And the Thrawn books, especially, uh, are pretty expansive. This is a fantastic way of consuming that. And in this is a super cool story. So this takes place during the time of the Empire. And Thrawn has been, uh, he's part of the Empire at this point. And Emperor Palpatine basically tells Thrawn and Vader, hey, there's a disturbance in the Force on the planet Batu, which is the place in Disney. Uh, uh-huh. I need you to go check it out. And, of course, they're like, okay. So they head out on uh, Thrawn's Star Destroyer. And on their way there, something happens, and it's unable to make the full jump to light speed in the Star Destroyer. And Vader and Thrawn, you see throughout this entire thing, they're kind of back and forth of their leadership styles. And one kind of, like, be like, they don't know where to take command from, the people on the ship. Because, like, Thrawn will say one thing, then Vader will be like, no, that's a bad idea. And they're kind of like, oh, <laughs> oh no. I know either of these people will probably kill right, me if right, I yeah. don't do what they say. Uh, but this strange anomaly happens, and Thrawn has a lot of ideas of what this could be that causes this. But he comes up with a plan to get them to the planet. And it's uh, it seems like it's maybe tied to something in the past, which is where the other part of the book takes place. Which, during the Clone Wars, Padme goes on a mission to a planet and uh, goes missing. And so Anakin follows up this is kind of episode three anakin or clone wars anakin follows up on this uh but on his way there he runs into thrawn who they have not met at this time this is the first meeting between anakin and thrawn Mm -hmm. who uh thrawn basically says what's your deal what are you going here for and and anakin's like someone's missing and he's like i'll help you do it so we're seeing in the past their first team up and then in the like present of the others part of the story is them together. And you can kind of tell the whole time that Thrawn knows that this is Anakin and the way he's manipulating him and playing him. And it's going to be a really cool series of seeing the back and forth between these two storylines and how these characters interact uh, and maybe what in the past affected what happens in the present. So uh, great story. This is a dense one. Uh, I think it's oversized. I really, really enjoyed it. So if you're looking for some more Thrawn stuff, if you saw him in Ahsoka and you're like, what is his deal? Yeah. This is a great way of kind of getting you caught up on his, you know, what's his history in the Star Wars universe. Uh, this does follow up. There was a previous Thrawn series from quite a few years yeah. ago uh, that took place, that, that adapted the first book. But you could jump into this one without having read that and nice. it's no problem at all. So that is Thrawn Alliance's number one. It's just super cool. Thrawn is such a great character. And we've got some variants for this. So we have this, which is the Clark variant. I really like this one. It is kind of a a promo image, but I just think this looks awesome. So this is just called like a promo cover with Anakin and Thrawn. Yeah, that does look good. Back before he was Grand Admiral (laughs) Thrawn. Mm. Uh, We have also this one, which will not last long. This is the 1 in 25 Renaud variant. They're we're selling for $45. I love that. It's so cool. Yeah. All right, so next for me is uh, Titans Beast World Tour Star City. So this, I think this is the last yeah. of the quote-unquote tour books, the last of the tie-ins. Um, you know, and really, this has been a great se- uh, a great crossover because the, the tie-ins have only been one-shots. There's only been four of them. Yeah. And then, you know, the Titans book, too. But uh, this one I will say is my favorite of all of the of all of the tour books so far. Um, so this one we get three stories, just like all the other ones. In the first one, Ollie and Connor they are fighting some beast people in Star City when they come across a, a graveyard where some of the bodies have been like exhumed from the grave and stolen, and they track those bodies down to the aquarium where uh, this duo known as the Resurrection Twins, and I don't I think this is they, the first appearance. I thought they were in Superman. Or, oh. uh, I th- I don't think it's their first appearance. Okay. I do believe they were in something else before. Okay. Because I remember them. Um, well, yeah, their name is Resurrection Twins. And they have implanted some of the Garo spores into these dead bodies. Yeah, it's They're very doing, dark. Yeah, it's twisted. Doing some experiments with them. And, of course, 
uh, Ollie and Connor, uh, they feel differently about this, you know, because Ollie says, well, they're already, they were already dead, and let's just, you know, arrow through the eye or whatever, and Connor's like, no, we've got to treat everybody because, you know, we've got to try to save them, that kind of thing. There's another story with Black, Car Black Canary and Red Canary, who we haven't seen in a while, uh, trying to help some people out in the city. Um, Red Canary, though, is still very unsure of herself. She's very inexperienced. She she does the best she can, but she's still just very not confident. So Black Canary has to sort of give her a pep talk and helps her feel more sure about herself. Um, and then there's some other things that happen with Black Canary there. And then there's another story where Stargirl and Red Arrow and Huntress take on a uh, a beastified Alan Scott and Judy Garrick, uh, who Jay Garrick's uh, daughter, who we are reading about in the Jay Garrick uh, miniseries. Uh, it's really fun. So just. Um, I liked. I just liked all these stories, and more than, than some of the others, because I, I like Star City. I yeah. like the Arrow family. The art in this was was in all three of these was really good. Um, just a fun, you know, another uh, didn't really inject much or really anything into the main Beast yeah. World story. So if you don't want to read the tie-ins, you're not gonna miss anything from the main story if you don't read this. But I did like it just because I like those characters. the uh, The first story with uh, Green Air, well, with uh, Oliver and Connor Hawk was uh, drawn by Jamal Campbell, and it looked amazing. Yeah. A lot of good action, a lot of good, like, uh, archery action, that kind of thing. So I just, I really like this one a lot. So there's our A cover right there. And then we have this one. Uh, we've uh, had other ones like this, right? Where yeah. it kind of looks like an old movie poster. Uh, you can, I guess that's Black Canary with the, uh, the fishnets. <laughs> and she's using her canary cry. Very cool. Okay, next up for me is... Resurrection of Magneto. So this is, of course, part of our Fall of X storyline. And what I've kind of learned about a lot of these is they're kind of, uh, they're each kind of attached to another book, um, a little bit with the characters and everything. So if you're reading X-Men Red, uh, that's kind of what this comes out of because it uh, focuses on Mars and mm. on uh, Storm, who is the leader there and everything. Uh, so this is written by Al Ewing, and the art is by uh, Luciano Vecchio, which it looks amazing. But I will be honest, it was a little hard for me to follow because I'm not caught up on X-Men Red. So it took some, uh, you know, just putting the pieces together in my head to figure out what's exactly going on in this. But it's also, of course, an Al Ewing book. So it gets weird. Yeah. Uh, in this, Storm has a nightmare about Magneto. And Magneto is dead at this point. I believe he died during uh, X of Swords. By, oh, was it that uh, long ago? I believe so, because okay. it kind of harkens back to that hmm. in here. Uh, and something about it, she, she figures that she needs to bring Magneto back from the dead. Uh... I may have missed why, like what really sent her over the edge that she needs to do this. But because uh, one, the all the stuff that happened in Krakoa, they can't bring people back from the dead anymore. But also Mars and Araco and everything always had this rule. Storm kind of was like, we don't really think that's a good thing to do. So they already weren't bringing people back from mm -hmm. the dead. But uh, what, where is she going to go to do this? Well, I was really happy to see that the person she goes to is Blue Marvel, who yes, I, I love Blue Marvel. Love Blue yeah, Marvel. He's, great. Uh, he's is he the first smartest? He's he's uh, in the top smartest people. He's up there for sure. He's like really high up there <laughs> in the smartest in the Marvel universe. And basically, Storm goes to him and is like, I know it's impossible. He's like, Impossible is where I start. <laughs> and uh, so there's a very weird uh, stuff that happens. Uh, I won't give it away. You'll have to read it, but. Storm does manage to actually go into uh, this place called basically the waiting room that was created by Scarlet Witch as a place between living and death where I think that's one of the reasons they can bring X-Men back from the dead is like their spirits kind of went there instead of completely going on. Uh, so it's really weird. There's a lot of weird imagery and uh, she gets a guide there or kind of a, a greeter that is maybe not so happy with this idea of bringing Magneto back, but Storm thinks there's something even worse going on to Magneto that she needs to uh, rescue him from this to help fight Orcus. So it is dense. It is very uh, existential. 
Uh, but if you like that kind of storytelling, if you're a big Al Ewing fan, uh, also very like Hickman feeling yeah. with some yes. very big concepts. Visually, it looks very Hickman. There's a lot of symbols and stuff. Yeah, a lot of symbols <laughs> and representations of yeah. things and all of that. You'll really like this. But I would say if you are, you know, you're like, oh, I'm a big Magneto fan and uh, haven't been reading anything in a while. This is not the one to pick up. Also, because Magneto's not really in it. It's more of the search to bring him back. Yet. Yet. <laughs> uh, he, there is a pretty significant page with him on it. Uh, but for the most part, this is going to be for your people who are reading all the X-Men, who, are, uh, who read X-Men Red, who are reading all of the Fall of X storylines. That's who this is going to make the most sense to. And if you're not reading those, but you still want to try it out, go ahead. It may just take a little bit more brain power to work through some of the ideas of it. But I thought it was super interesting. The art was fantastic. So that is Resurrection of Magneto number one. We've got some variant covers for this one. Which, of course, we've got this awesome John Tyler Christopher. Yeah, that looks great. Uh, negative Space variant. Magneto is one of my favorite X-Men characters, so I love anything around him. We've got this awesome foil Baldion cover. Yeah, that one looks. I don't like. Yeah, it looks better in person. Like oh, the camera yeah. doesn't do it justice. But that foil cover looks phenomenal. Yeah, and then we have this Nick Nick Klein Stormbreakers variant. I like that one too. I would love yeah. to see that one. In I love classic. Yeah, Magneto. Yeah. All right. So next up for me is the first issue of Power Pack Into the Storm. Now, originally and. I don't know if I said this when we talked about this on Comics from the Future. I thought this was a one-shot, but it is not a one-shot. It is a mini-series of either four or five issues. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. You could see in the future far enough to see four. At least four. There's at least four, I can tell you that much. Um, so, And what's really cool about this is it's written by Louise Simonson, and the art is by June Brigman, who is your original creative team, your original creators on Power Pack. Um, it says in, uh, like, the very first thing it says inside is this takes place after Power Pack Grow Up, number one, which I do think that was a one shot from 2019. Um, I didn't read it, so I'm not... So I will say this, too. Um, I have a very big... I've read thousands of Marvel comics over several decades, but I have a blind spot when it comes to Power Pack. I know next to nothing about them other than the fact that they exist. They're so you know how big the powers. Marvel Universe is. Yeah. I've read thousands of comics. Never touched these. I've never read a Power Pack comic before, but I am aware, you're, you're of, aware them. of them. I'm aware yeah. of them, yeah. Um, so for Power Pack fans out there, you'll probably get a little bit more out of this than I did. You know, there's some callbacks and stuff like that. But um, this takes place in the past, I guess you could say, because Franklin Richards is in this, but he's younger. He's a, he's a, he's a young kid. He's not a teenager like he is in the current books. <clears throat> um, and Franklin has a dream about these aliens from space coming to Earth to rule Earth and to take out Power Pack. Well, luckily, he is going to stay with them. Like, the Fantastic Four make a cameo in this, and he's actually going... He was already planned to go stay with the Powers family for a couple weeks anyway. So he gets out there. They have a nice cookout and everything. But then he tells the, the other kids in Power Pack about his dream that they had, and that uh, his dream that he had, and they decide they need to... You investigate they, they got to do something about it however their parents do not know that they have powers so that's a big plot point is like oh we gotta we gotta make sure that mom and dad don't find out we have powers oh but maybe we should just tell them uh oh no mom is would be terrified that kind of thing um while all this is going on it cuts back and forth between all of that stuff and then another story set in space where there is a um there's an uh, one of their friends an alien friend of theirs named Kofi who um, uh, makes another friend when they go to, like, we'll just call it alien school because it's out in space, right? So they make another friend, and they're showing off... Um, Kofi is actually showing off their their ship, and uh, they get in, but then they accidentally, like, take off into space and start getting chased by some, like... They kind of felt like pirates or something like that. <clears throat> and they say, oh, don't worry, I know where to go. Uh, Earth is nearby, and I have friends there. Let's go there, but of course they're being chased by these other aliens, and we know that Franklin Richards had a dream about aliens coming to Earth and that kind of thing. So it all kinds of comes together in the end. And uh, but that's but that's where the the issue ends is where right when it starts to form into a cohesive story. So you don't have to read more to find out what happens. But for the Power Pack fans out there, you've got a new Power Pack miniseries to enjoy. 
by the original creative team. So it's very, very cool. So we have our A cover right here. And oh, we actually don't have a variant for this one either. So just this one cover. So next up, I've got a big one to talk about that I've been very excited to read. Uh, and I haven't even read every issue of X-Force in this run, but this is X-Force number 48, Target Beast, part one. I love that cover. That That's is so great. cool. So this is one of my, like, uh, I don't want to say obsessions, but like one of my things like through all of these uh, that I always want to check back in on is what's going on with Beast. Mm -hmm. Because I love Beast. I love classic Beast, 90s Beast, uh, all of that. But Beast, uh, to my standards is pretty irredeemable yeah, at this he's point. He's off the deep end. He's done some truly terrible things in the name of protecting mutants, but to the point of like, even mutants are like, no, you've gone too yeah. far. Well, that is where we are in this. Uh, it's finally time to stop Beast, who has been terrorizing and, and viruses and just horrible things. Uh, the X-Force uh, and especially Sage has an idea how to stop Beast after a recent attack that Beast did against them. And it's not a spoiler to say that if you've seen, like we talked about the next issue mm -hmm. where it has Beast teamed up with a uh, Wonder Man and it talks about like a, a Beast from the past is coming to uh, basically try to stop the, the main Beast. Uh, I will say that it does not involve time travel. I don't want to give away how this happens, yeah. but uh, Sage's plan does involve basically having another beast uh, to combat Beast. And this beast is specifically taken from his time uh, right when he joined the New Defenders. So when was that? Uh, it referenced New Defenders number 142, and I think that was like back in the 80s. Yeah. So you're getting your classic beast back. Uh, in a very interesting way. Now, what does this mean? Can even he be trusted? Because Wolverine doesn't think so. Uh, but I think this is super cool. I'm very excited to uh, read this whole Target B storyline because I don't I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be. Are they going to kill the like the beast that's gone too far and replace him with this? Uh, classic beast. This classic beast has to be kind of informed about everything. Uh, that's happened since his time well, by Black Tom Cassidy. And that, cool. that issue they referenced was from 1985. So okay. obviously there's the sliding time scale in comics, but they are going back 40 years in the comics. Yeah, so it's really funny to see this beast uh, have to learn, oh, we we had a whole nation? Oh, yeah. but it, it went bad? Like, yeah. it's really yeah. funny. Oh, it's not around anymore? But uh, definitely... If you even if you have been reading X Force, check this one out if you're kind of curious about what's going on because I think this is a super cool storyline and that I'm very interested to see how this kind of progresses uh, through the fall of X with yeah. this classic beast there. Now. That's what I want to know is like what is you know the next issue obviously, but what is what does this mean going forward? Yeah. You know like what is is old beast gonna take out new beast and then old beast is going to be current beast or like i want to know what's going to yeah. happen but it's nice to have after everything that's happened weird with the x-men a touch of like super classic super classic that's the familiar good yep. guy beast that yep. i know yep. so uh definitely check that one out but we got to talk about it <laughs> so uh if you're on the internet at all and follow any comic book related things you saw this cover this is the cassidy variant I am not going to uh, say much about it other than what do you think about it? Uh, what is the story behind this? I haven't heard if there's any updates of this cover, but uh, it reminds me if you uh, think about the classic Liefeld Captain America barrel chest cover that uh, everyone has an opinion on yeah. and uh, now everybody wants because it's such a almost a meme. It's 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 an iconic cover, and, and I think this one will end up being that way too, but for the wrong reasons. Yes. You know? But uh, there's a lot going on here, especially even if you look at it in person. So if you want a piece of comic history, pick up this variant for X Force and let us know in the comments what do you think about it. Uh, it'd be great to hear. Yeah, um, like like the Liefeld cover, you know, it's going to go down in infamy. I think yeah. you know. Oh, remember that. It's going to be used as examples of like, oh, remember that that cover yep. from back in the day? Yeah. So uh, you form your own opinion on it and let us know. But that did come out this week, and I feel like it's going to go fast because probably not ordered by too many stores. 
Uh, but it's it's going to be talked about for a while. I will say that is still leaps and bounds better than any art that I can do whatsoever. <laughs> but admittedly, it is a bit of a head scratcher. Like it that's is. that's not what we're used to, I guess. But also, we have this really awesome one in twenty five Nick Bradshaw variant. It we're selling for like eighteen dollars. Just love Beast. Yeah, yeah. Nick Bradshaw is great, and Classic Beast is great. <laughs> All right. So next for me is Superior Spider Man number three. And this one was a ton of fun. This series con continues to be a ton of fun. So uh, as a, at the end of last issue, Supernova kidnapped Anna Maria and gave uh, Spider-Man, because uh, she doesn't know the difference between yeah. Doc Ock Spider-Man and Peter Spider-Man, but she gave Spider-Man uh, a 24-hour deadline to come to the place where it all began. Obviously, Peter doesn't know where that <laughs> is, uh, to, to, to save Anna Maria. So in this issue, we see Peter and Dr. Octopus actually working together reluctantly. Dr. Octopus is definitely not a good guy. It's not one of those re re redemption arcs. Um, but they are reluctantly working together to figure out a plan to save Anna Maria. And they, they're, they're building something. And they need one item from one of Dr. Octopus's secret base, bases. And it's a very deep... This, this secret base is, is um, very specific... And very special to Spider-Man history. Oh. Uh, it's a very, very deep cut as to what it is. But I don't want to tell you what it is because I didn't piece it together either until they talked about it. Um, so, in order to get there, though, like, it's, oh, it's decked out in state-of-the-art security and all that kind of stuff. So, in order to get in, Peter has to put on the the superior Spider-Man costume, which is my favorite Spider-Man costume of all time. But he also has to act like... Dr. Octopus acted when he was the superior Spider-Man. So he has to, you know, the die is cast and <laughs> calling everybody dolts and things like that. Um, but he has to do that too so that he can fool all of the minions who were still there since Doc Ock was Spider-Man. And yet Peter's like, what have they been doing this whole time? And Doc Ock's like, they've been doing what they're supposed to have been doing, earning a paycheck and guarding everything that's down there. So, you know... There's still a bunch of minions down there, even though Doc Ock hasn't been Spider-Man for a long time. Um, so, you know, Peter does put on the suit. And, uh, you know, there's some action in it because uh, they the minions don't take to him at first. And they, you know, Spider-Man has sort of fight them. But it, this one is very funny because, you know, Peter has a little earpiece in his ear. And Doc Ock is telling him what to say. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, he's like, what one guy questions him. And Doc Ock's like, you now hadn't, you, you know... Uh, you need to, to backhand him, you know, show him who's boss. And Peter's like, seriously? And then, he, you know, back. <laughs> so there's all these, you know, Peter's very, is acting reluctantly like Dr. Octopus. It's very, very funny. Um, there's a lot more in it than just that. But uh, I really liked it. It's just a, just a fun comic book, right? Just a, you, something you sit down, you have a smile on your face when you're reading it. So if you've been reading it, don't miss out because it is a fun issue. There's our A cover right there. And then we have these, I guess these are called the uh, the Wolverine, Wolverine, Wolverine variants. <laughs> And I love that with uh, the Wolverine ASM. No more. Yeah, Wolverine No More, the ASM number 50 homage. So cool. Okay, next up, I've got one we both read. This is Titan's Beast oh, World yeah. number five. This is the penultimate issue of Beast World. And this one was really good. So, yes. uh, also because I believe Ivan Rice was back on art yes. for, for a lot of this. Well, for some, for some of, of it. it. For it wasn't the, the whole thing, yeah. but for a lot of it. Um, so this one's really big because uh, basically Amanda Waller comes out of the shadows mm -hmm. uh, because of her, uh, what is the organization called? It? Oh, the Bureau of Sovereignty. The Bureau of Sovereignty, yeah. which is kind of her pet project. Right. Kind of the way she's selling herself to like the president and everything. It, it gives her, not superpower, but like, pat, like governmental powers yeah. to where she can do what she wants without having to get like the president sign off yeah. and that kind of thing. She can just... She has carte blanche to do whatever she wants, basically. So basically, she celebrates that she has uh, destroyed uh, Garo, or you know, the Conqueror, as they call him. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, to the Titans is devastating. But she's painting it as this picture of like, we risked it all, and but we did it, and uh, but there's still, you know, there's not going to be any more of these like beast hybrids uh, created because we've destroyed it, but. There is still the ones that remain, yeah. but we're going to take some pretty drastic measures uh, to eliminate them. Even though they're your family and friends, 
Uh, but we thank them for their sacrifice. Yeah, she, she gives a press conference and she's like, you know, we know this is going to be hard, but we thank you for your sacrifice and it's for the greater good. Because it's like a million people. Basically. Yeah, yeah, it's a million people. And of course, the Titans are like, no, we can't let this yeah, happen. Yeah, we can't we do that. Have to, because also, they've shown that like you can take the spores out mm-hmm. and return people back to normal. And so, but Amanda Waller doesn't want <clears throat> them to know that. Right. She wants to, this is a... She's Amanda Waller, and she always has ulterior motives, yeah. you know. So, uh, it is up to the Titans to uh, prevent this from happening and to stop Waller. And one of the best parts in this is you do, uh, Nightwing manages to come face-to-face with Waller and Peacemaker mm. for a really awesome throwdown yeah. between those two. Uh, but... There's something else going on. One, we have uh, Raven, who is very distraught about, you know, that was kind of her love was Beast Boy and the kind of pain she's dealing with there. But also we get a confrontation with Dr. Hate where Dr. Hate's helmet finally comes off and it is revealed who Dr. Hate is. And I did not see it coming. Did not see it coming. Uh, And it's pretty, it's going to set up a lot for future Mm storylines. Uh, so I feel like how the, uh, what was the, the original Starro thing in this? The, oh, the Necrostar? The Necrostar seemed like the big thing, but then it turns out, oh no, it was Garo that was the big thing. I feel like this Dr. Hate reveal is kind of being like, actually, look at this. Yeah. You know, it's kind of one-upping itself to a big, a big climax. So very excited for the final issue, but, uh. If you've been reading Titans, uh, Beast World, all of that, it's it's really coming to a really cool head. Yeah, there's only can... one issue left. The part six is or issue six is the last yeah. part, so it's it's coming to a close. There's, there's a lot going down in this mm-hmm. one, so uh, highly recommend. Just continue to read Titans Beast World because it is great, and plus the art just on point. This issue, and like the other ones, we got some variants like this awesome yeah. lenticular cover with Harley. Getting her Hulk rabbit on. Yeah, and I say it every time, but the, it's it's amazing how clear and crisp those yeah. images are. A lot of the lenticular covers are kind of faded or whatever, but these look very, very good. Yeah, and these go fast. So yeah, they're order, great. Order now, like yeah. QVC. That's right, and they're on the website right now, so <laughs> hurry up and get it. Yes. Uh, we also have this Barenz cover with Donna Troy. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And lastly, I love this one. This is the uh, Javier Fernandez variant. With uh, Batman and his uh, wolfen form, yeah. too. Yeah, that one was really cool. <clears throat> All right, so next for me is uh, Punisher number three. Continuing Joe Garrison's run as the Punisher. And this one, the overarching story that's being told in this is, is getting really, really interesting. Um, so at the beginning of this... Um, I will say too. I think this is the first appearance of a new a new version of the villain called Fear Master. Uh, the F- Fear Master is a uh, a villain who originally appeared in Punisher twenty ninety nine number two from back in nineteen ninety three, but this version is wildly different than that version. Um, so the Punisher's on the run from the cops. You know they're chasing him down, and he ducks into an old manufacturing plant just to sort of hide out. But in there, Fear Master, this villain Fear Master, is in there waiting for him and. Kind of gives me vibes of Scarecrow a little bit, yeah. uh, Batman's villain Scarecrow, because um, she uses these fear toxins to make him sort of hallucinate and see horrifying images of his dead <laughs> family. Like yeah, Scarecrow. you know he he sees all these images of his dead family, and they're like, "Why didn't you burn with us? You know, why weren't you in the <laughs> house when it exploded with us?" That kind of thing. And you know, it, it, as as tough as the Punisher is, that messes with him a little bit. You know, um, while all that's going on, his a uh, guy in the chair, or I guess girl in the chair, Triple A, um, she's actually kidnapped out of out of their headquarters, and we learn <clears throat> who uh, we learn who takes her, and basically, well, not who specifically, but like the organization that takes her, the organization that put out the hit on I guess his wife, as we found out last issue, and the name <clears throat> of the organization is very, very interesting. I won't tell you what it is because when I turned that page, I was like, oh, that's really mm. kind of neat. So, um, but it's very, it's very cool. And it's, and the story is getting deeper and, and more involved. So if you've been reading the first two, then uh, this, I mean, it's a, you know, it's almost like each one of these books has been kind of a one and done 
but they're telling a larger connecting yeah. story. But like Fear Master is only in this one. The last one dealt with uh, the uh, I can't remember the, the villain's name, but he was only in that one. So yeah. it's a nice combination of one and done stories, but also telling an overarching story. It's pretty darn interesting, especially that last page. I was like, oh, I really want to see yeah. what, what comes next. So uh, pretty darn good. This is uh, our A cover for number three. And then we have <laughs> another of the Wolverine variants. Uh, I thought Wolverine would shave with his own claws, but I guess he yeah, it feels like a missed opportunity. Yeah, he used a straight razor like the rest of us, I guess. But uh, I like that his, he puts his mask on a mannequin oh, head. Okay. He's got to keep it nice yeah, and pristine. You do, especially those ear parts. If you just throw them down, they're going to start getting real wrinkled. Yeah, for and sure. Yeah, so very, Wolverine does not appear shaving in this issue, just, just to let you know. <laughs> or at all. Or at all, yeah. But especially not shaving. But especially not shaving. Okay, next up, I do have a new number one for all you fans of the classic D&D mm. animated series. This is Saturday Morning Adventures Dungeons & Dragons 2, number one. This is kind of a uh, volume two to the series, but anyone can jump on because it's kind of like watching an episode of the show. Yep. So this is by David M. Boer, and <laughs> the art is by George Kambadas, who, if you've been reading Gargoyles, is your artist there. And this is really cool. So I'm not as familiar with the animated show. I know the characters enough to recognize them and stuff. Uh, I know the storyline about the roller coaster and all that yeah. fun stuff. I know that it never got resolved. Right. Oh, it still eats at me to this day. That. Uh, but even given you know my limited knowledge, this was great. Because I have read some of the Forgotten Realms novels. Mm -hmm. And that ties heavily into this. So the team uh, of the animated series characters... Are at the spine of the world, which is like a, a mountain range in the Forgotten Realms world, and uh, they are looking for a healing herb to uh, help the dungeon master, who is like their wise sage. Yeah, their guide. He's their the guide. one that gave him their weapons and it's stuff. Not with them, but they are. And there's something wrong with him. They can't figure out what it is. It's not a virus. It's not any normal sickness. Uh, and so their their desperation is sending them to a very dangerous snow covered place in the spine of the world to find this herb. But uh, while there, they're getting lost, they're getting turned around, they're arguing. Thankfully, there's a guide there that appears. And for all of you big uh, Forgotten Realms fans, I will give you a little bit of a uh, spoiler. That is uh, Driss Duarden, who is like the biggest character from the novels and okay. everything, the Dark Elf, uh, makes an appearance in here, which is really awesome to see these characters interact. Uh, but he is not the only novel character that appears in here, because uh, there are more. As they realize that this herb is not going to do, it's just it helps for the sickness for a little bit, uh, but they're going to have to find something better that works. And Driz says, I know some. there's someone on the Sword Coast uh that can help him out but it's a very dangerous place it's a very pirate infested mm. place uh so you got to be careful i'll i've got someone i know who's going to be there to help you uh but you need to be careful so they're going to go on this journey they they end up there right away but uh uh something else happens where uh what's his name uh bobby gets in a disagreement with Sheila Bobby the barbarian yeah. And uh, Sheila basically says, you're becoming more and more like a barbarian. Uh, that's not cool. Bobby gets mad and leaves. Now he is lost out in the city of pirates. They're going to have to get him back, make sure he's safe, all the while trying to find the cure for the Dungeon Master. It's a good time. Yeah. It's a really good time. It's such a fun story. I love reading these just like light adventure, mm -hmm. uh, not drown in any kind of continuity, uh, you know, like... If this is your first time reading these characters, you'll get the hang of it right away. So, just highly recommend this one. Uh, this is Dungeons Drag or Saturday Morning Adventures Dungeons and Dragons Two. Uh, I don't even think it has it doesn't have a subtitle or anything, but uh, definitely pick this one up if you're a fan of any of the stuff I talked about. Yeah, what's interesting is you know I I grew up watching the cartoon on Saturday mornings, um, so I'm I'm somewhat familiar with the characters from what I remember, but I don't know any of the Forgotten yeah. Realm stuff at all. So. I would have picked up on, oh, that's, you know, Bobby and he's got his glowing club and all this yeah. stuff. But like, but when it comes to the big villain that you mentioned, like I would, that would have been lost on me yeah. completely. Um, but that, I want to go read that because I loved the cartoon as a yeah. kid. I want to get more of all that. All the Saturday morning adventure books are great. They're great. Yeah. They're awesome. The Ninja Turtles and Judge. Yeah. It was yeah. great. 
Um, all right, so next for me is Daredevil uh, Black Armor number three. This is the next to last issue of this awesome miniseries. There's actually not a whole lot to say about this book because it's just a big bunch of fighting, which has been what's great about yeah, this whole wait, thing. Wait, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that at all. And the art is great too, but it's a lot of action, which is very, very good. Um, so Matt and, you know, Matt's been kidnapped by Baron Von Strucker, taken down into the tunnels where a lot of other people have been taken down into tunnels and being held against their will. And they're being forced to fight against a group of supervillains. Uh, maybe some like B and C list villains. You've got like Tarantula, okay. you've got Lady Deathstrike and some other ones that I know have been around before, but I, just, I can't place their name right now. But you've got this big group of villains um, versus this group of just like civilians yeah. and you know but luckily they have daredevil on their side uh of course they don't know that they have daredevil on their side but um you know matt comes up with a plan to get them out but uh obviously it's easier said than done um i don't know that, that's it i mean and then there's from there it's just a lot of fisticuffs uh seeing you know matt daredevil take on all these different random villains and seeing some of the civilians take them on as well uh, I don't know. That's I mean, that's it. It's just a bunch of fighting, yeah. but it's really good. It looks great. It's super duper fun. I have very much... This has been one of my favorite of all of these back in the 90s yeah. era miniseries that Marvel's done. This has been one of my favorites by far. So uh, if you've been reading it, don't miss the third issue because there's only one more after this. So there's our A cover right there. Great time and then, to be a Daredevil fan. Yeah. Oh, it's a great time to be a Daredevil fan. And then we have this very cool Kevin Eastman uh, Daredevil versus uh, some ninjas. The Foot Clan. They they keep uh, they keep teasing us. It's like oh, they, right, we're right on the cusp of doing a Daredevil Ninja Turtles. Maybe with this new Ninja Turtles Jason Aaron stuff, oh. maybe we'll get Daredevil thrown in there. Okay, next up is I, I told Matt earlier. I think this is one of the best comics coming out. That's that's my hot yes, take. I like it. The Holy Roller uh, is fantastic, and it continues to be great uh, with this issue number. Uh, I wrote down issue number three? one. It's issue number three. Yeah. I, I was on a number one kick <laughs> on my iPad. Uh, but what I love about this is it is definitely decompressed storytelling in the great way. You know, like I said, the previous issue probably could have all taken place within like a 20 minute yeah. time frame. This one is very similar to that. Uh, but it's cool because after the events of the previous one, Levi, our main character, after he in self defense, uh, fought off the people who invaded his home. He fought them off with the bowling ball. He is now in jail. Oh. And uh, he his big loud mouth gets him in a lot of trouble, even in jail, where he says some stuff that uh, gets... It, it gets him beat up even in jail. That's really funny. Uh, also, Levi attempts to basically... He does get out of jail, but he attempts to... Like, this town is so messed up. I'm going to take me and my dad and my friend and everything. We're going to leave. But his dad is basically like, I've lived here. I've lived in this house for 50 years. This is, you know, my wife and I had this. I'm going to die in this house. Mm. And Levi's like, we really need to go. Uh, but what new lows will the higher-ups in the town go to uh, to hurt Levi and his family? You'll have to read it to find out. But it's pretty... It's dark and mean, but also this is some of the best comedy I've read in oh, okay, comics. Cool. There's some just some jokes that I just always like, yeah, that's actually funny. That feels like it was written by a like a solid comedian. Yeah. So you could tell Rick Remender, Andy Samberg, uh, Joe Troman, all having a just a great time with this. And if this doesn't turn into like an HBO series or something, oh, there, that's a, that's a crime. Yeah. Because this is so good for that. So. Uh, Holy Roller number three just continues to be fantastic. Uh, check it out. It makes me think of like you know the movie Walking Tall with uh, with The Rock. Yeah. Or uh, there was a, that's a remake, but it makes me think of like it's 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 confined to like this small town, but there's small bad town guys. Politics. Yeah, small town politics, and there's a guy who runs everything, and he's got henchmen, which sounds very uh, very like serious. But it's all in the confines of this small little town. Yeah. But within their own little world, it's it's, it's a, major. Yeah. You know, that's that, that's what it reminds me of. All right, so next for me is a Miguel O'Hara, Spider-Man 2099, number four. Continues to be a very pleasant series. Uh, weekly, coming out every week, and every issue is a one-and-done story. I, I love that 
type of publishing. I wish we would get more of that. Uh, so in this one, it's Spider-Man versus, uh, according to the cover, Terror Inc. for $20.99. Um, I actually don't know much about Terror uh, Inc. either. I'm aware of it, but I, just like Power Pack, I don't know a whole lot about it, about Terror. But uh, in this one, Spider-Man's on the trail of a guy named Wynn Downs, who's part of a group named the Gene Guard, G-E-N-E, -E, the Gene Guard. And they're a group that hates all mutants. They hate inhumans. They hate degens. Anybody who's like, any kind of has like any kind of genetic difference, they don't like those kind of guys. Uh, so Wynn goes to this hotel that he thought he thought he was going there because he thought he was going to get to like beat down on some genetically different beings. But instead it's actually run by terror who uses all these different kind of body parts to hunt when. And so when becomes the hunted and terror, like, you know, he, he, one of his things is he like has to get different body parts. So he gets like, he puts on a, a different foot, but it's, it's cool to see what body parts he uses because they have references and callbacks to characters that yeah. are like in present day Marvel. But I won't say who because it's it's really cool to see that done. And then so Spider Man intervenes, but then the rest of the issue is basically just just kind of like last, kind of like all these issues have been. Spider Man intervenes, and then it's Spider Man versus the villain of the <laughs> issue fighting each other. But it's very cool, and especially this one because of the different body parts that Terror uses to fight Spider Man. Uh, it's just it's just a lot of fun. Like it's just a good comic book, and then by the time you get to the end, this particular story is done, and you've had a good story. So. Just good on you, Marvel. Do do more of this, because this has been great. Uh, so we have our A cover right there. Nice homage to um, uh, Amazing Spider-Man 30-something, you know, where he lifts the he lifts How the dare thing. you not know exactly the little stuff? No, I think it's like 32 or something. Um, but then we also have this uh, cool variant by um, Klaus, uh, Klaus Janssen. I like that one quite a bit. And then we have this cool uh, 1 in 10 uh, Campania design variant that we're selling for $10. And that is Terror right there. Okay, next up for me, I've got Power Girl number five. I really want to read this issue because this is a Streaky focused issue. Streaky, the super cat, <laughs> who uh, of course is Power Girl's cat. And this one just feels like one of those classic uh, animal tales where after Power Girl falls asleep at home, uh, Streaky goes out, dons his cape, and flies out. I don't know if Streaky's a boy or girl, but uh, Streaky flies out uh, to help the neighborhood and the street finds out that some pets have gone missing there's a lot of missing pet posters and stuff so streaky uses their uh superpowers their very superman powers of listening and can uh determine where these missing animals are and goes to fight the criminal and save the pets uh now what's funny in it is there is dialogue but you can't understand it because all of the speech balloons have uh cat ears on them okay so it means uh, like that's what streaky's here okay and so it's kind of just gibberish uh until the end because uh there's uh kind of a setup for the next issue at the end but this is a really fun kind of one and done story mm -hmm. about streaky and what what the pets do at night type thing secret secret life of pets and everything uh but super fun the arts by david baldion which is great uh, a lot of energy and stuff so I uh, just recommended if you like something fun like that. <clears throat> is Power Girl number five, the streaky issue. We also have uh, some great variants for this. I believe this is uh, Jeff yep. Spokes. Yep. We've got the Jeff Spokes variant. Power Girl at the gym. We have the uh, Raza variant. And then we have this. One in 25 Danny variant that we're selling for $25. All right, so next up, I've got, uh, whoops, Green Arrow number eight. And, you know, we are, we are, you know, Oliver Queen's back on his real, real earth now. We're more street level stories again. And in this one, he and Connor Hawk are, on, are searching for Roy Harper because they, you know, he realized he was missing last issue. <clears throat> so they, they run afoul of Onomatopoeia. Uh, uh, that's a fun character. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in this one, Onomatopoeia appears to have killed Oliver Queen, and Connor Hawk sort of tracks him down to get revenge. I can't really tell you too much more than that without spoiling the the the, the twists and the ending. But I will say we do learn that Onomatopoeia is working for Brick, um, and there's a there's a little bit of an Amanda Waller factor in there too as well. So she's got her little paws and everything right now. 
But uh, everything is not as it seems with this issue is what I'll say. But um, I don't know, just just fun. Uh, this one focuses more on Connor Hawk, and he's great as he tracks down Onomatopoeia for allegedly killing uh, uh, Oliver Queen. It's just another great, solid issue of Green Arrow. I'm so glad this has been promoted to an ongoing because I want this forever. So we have our really cool A cover right there. We have this really nice um, Alan Qua variant. I wish this was the one I had pre-ordered because that looks so great. Oh, and that's it. That's, that's, the, it. Only, that's the only two. Well, the last one for me is Marvel's Gods number four. So let me give you a detailed, in-depth review and description of what it is. I Good can't luck. do that because <laughs> it is a dense and odd book. Now, I'm looking forward to when it's all over to kind of look back on it and, yeah. and piece it all together. This one, we do learn about a character named Robert uh, that we kind of saw something pertaining to him in an earlier issue uh, where he's forced to live inside of a box and just learn science. Uh, huh. by Go the, get in that box and learn science. Yeah, by the <laughs> in-betweener. And then later he's released and he goes and works for AIM. Uh, but the in-betweener comes calling once again because it wants him to create something for him and uh yeah super weird uh the art is fantastic in this uh but this is another kind of piece of a jigsaw puzzle that when you stand back you still can't see the full page right the full, full picture but uh i thought it was a really interesting issue and the stuff with dr strange and uh wind at the end of it really really cool so uh yeah just another issue of marvel's gods as we're slowly kind of figuring out what all this means. Mm -hmm. We've got this, I believe this is the Masafara variant. That looks really cool. We also have the Ron Lim, uh, kind of classic Marvel Cosmic cover. Looks like the Living Tribunal. It does, Maybe the kind new... of a weird version of it. Yeah. And then we have this 1 in 25 Nguyen variant that we're selling for $15. Well, last for me is Detective Comics number 1081. And I wanted to highlight this just real quick because if you've been reading this whole, if Ron V's whole saga that he's been telling in Detective Comics, this is the next, uh, I guess, um, the next act. Uh, it's Gotham Nocturne Act 3, An Elegy of Sand Part 1. So it's the next it's the next and final grand act of everything that Ron V's been doing in Detective Comics. Um, just continuing everything that they've been doing with the Orgums. We know that uh, the end of last issue, which was the end of Act 2, um, Catwoman and her ally successfully got Batman out of Gotham, but he's still possessed by that Asmer demon, thanks to the Orgums. Uh, so Talia actually takes him deep into the desert, where he kind of has he, he sort of has to battle his inner demons. It's, it's very hard to describe, because it's all very metaphysical yeah. and supernatural and that kind of thing. Um, but this is also intertwined with a story about Rene Montoya as the question, trying to solve a murder, essentially. There's a little bit more to it than that, but she's trying to, to, to solve a murder. But what's interesting about that story um, is that it shows how Gotham is starting to forget Batman oh. by design, by the design of the organs. Not just because he hasn't been there in a while, but, you know, purposely, uh, you know, there, there's a little something in the air, basically, that's making <laughs> them forget but, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a tough issue to describe, but just wanted to point it out that if you've been reading this, this is the, uh, the next big part of Ron V's magnum opus, I guess, in, yeah. in Detective Comics. So we have our A cover right there. We've got a few variants for this one as well. This is the uh, Inhyuk Lee variant. Right there. creepy. Yeah, this is the, uh, well, and this is kind of what the inside looks like. This is our uh, Federici variant, and that, that gives you an idea about what Batman's sort of doing to, to fix himself. Oh, shoot, I left out a, and this is not, a, uh, there, was a, there was another Green Arrow variant. This is the 1 in 25 Howard Porter variant that we're selling for $15. Sorry, I, I, that one was, that one got left out. That's another Green Arrow variant. That was hiding behind a Batman. Yeah, it was. That's well, it. yeah, this was a big week with some big books. Uh, definitely head over to infinityflux.net right now. Just a quick reminder, infinityflux.net, where you can order these books we talked about right now while supplies last. So don't tarry. Uh, head over there <laughs> and pick them up because these will not last. Some great stuff this week. Pre-order the comics uh, upcoming. All that good stuff at infinityflux.net. And stay tuned for our video coming up on Wednesday. We'll be going over some of the books that you can pre-order by this weekend early so you don't miss out on any of the good stuff. 
And I think that is it. That's it. So thank you so much for watching. And until next time, see ya. See ya.